Um, yeah, so we're a few minutes past uh, 10 Alberta time, 12 p.m. Uh, Ontario time. So I think we can jump into it. We'll let people trickle in um, as obviously the conversation continues. But my name is Ryan Day. I'm with Calvert Home Mortgage, obviously. I'm the real estate investment success manager or focus on business development. Uh, then have my um, handsome colleague here, Rob Maver, who uh, is, is a senior underwriter. Uh, I can let him introduce uh, himself and provide a little bit of context. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, like like he said, I'm one of the senior underwriters here at Calvert, and we have a team here with a lot of underwriters who are deeply committed to helping out real estate investors. Uh, right now, we are running at about uh, seven people, and the reason why we're set up this way is so we can pick up phones and answer uh, inquiries and help you guys solve problems at the speed of business. And uh, and we're looking to give you guys a little bit of insight, a little bit of data points to reference today and uh, looking forward to spending some time with you guys this morning. Perfect. Thanks for the intro, Maeve. So uh, just uh, a quick, quick overview and kind of summary of uh, what we have today for you. So the first about 30 minutes or so will be a market insights. Um, We'll be reviewing topics on, you know, how to vet a private lender, what we're currently seeing in the market, opportunities, risks that that we're currently seeing. Want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, more than happy to answer questions uh, after we share our, our market insights. Um, and then after we share our market insights as well, too, we'll have a list of wholesalers that uh, will be providing their buyers list link. So you're able to sign up on their buyers list. I know uh, the hardest thing about um, getting into real estate is obviously finding the right deal. So hopefully by signing up on these buyers lists, we'll be able to remove that barrier to entry to find uh, find a really good deal. So without further ado, um, let's jump into it. Perfect. Uh, Ryan, uh, do you want me to take it from here? Sure. Awesome. All right. A uh, little bit about Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation. We started off in 1975 as a brokerage, and we became a MIC, a mortgage investment corporation, in 1982. What a MIC does is they take money, uh, shareholder capital, a lot of MICs have bank debt as well, and they will invest in lending opportunities that uh, the market otherwise can't serve. Um, our focus as a lender is short-term lending opportunities, so flips, burrs, bridge loans, quick possessions, uh, you know, or quick rush purchases or short purchases where somebody's lending on the market value of the property rather than the down payment and there's a sale or a refinance happening. That's the kind of business that we love. And we are operating in Alberta and Ontario. And our mission as a company is to be trusted advisors offering an effortless experience for the, first no for the personal and financial success of others. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we do not approve loans that we do not believe in. They need to be beneficial for our client. They need to be beneficial for us and that we're not taking on a lot of risk and that we're putting the client in a better position um, than we found them in. So if it's getting somebody into a burr, if it's helping somebody make money on a flip, if it's helping them save a deposit or purchase a new property, uh, that's what we do. Uh, we don't participate in the, the lending just to collect a fee if you will. Awesome. All right. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to give you guys today is some tools and some reference points to figure out what is happening right now on the news. Uh, when real estate is in the news, it's never good because house prices are falling off of a cliff or house prices are going up so fast and you're gonna be living in your parents' basement for the rest of your life. There's no, in, there's no middle ground when real estate is in the news. Um, so how do we get past the headlines, look at the data, distill the data and figure out what, um, and, and, and make sense of what actually is happening here. Um, two key indicators that I look at and that Calvert looks at amongst many others our house price index and benchmark price. And we put up a couple quick definitions for each. Uh, but the MLS HPI is based on the value that home buyers assign to various housing attributes, which tend to gradually evolve over time. 
So it's an apples to apples comparison. And this tracks how the typical home, you know, your, your artificial typical home price value is moving over time. They started recording this in 2005. So that's why the data point doesn't go back further than this. Um, but this will give you a really good indicator of overall house price movement in certain markets and cer certain areas. Then we have benchmark price. Um, and this is classified as your general property. So what is a general property in a community or a general property in a community slash city? Um, you know, that'll vary per community, but it's going to be what st as statisticians believe is the most average property in that area. A certain amount of bedrooms, certain amount of baths, certain square footage, certain age, um, and it'll track that artificial average or um, predictable home is uh, movement over time. Now, this isn't an average, and it's really important to know that this is an average house price, and I'll tell you why is because that can be really slanted to the left or to the right, i.e. if you had more high-end homes transact, then you're going to be slanted one way. But if you had more of a different price point transact in a certain month, you're going to be a little bit slanted this way, and your data would be very skewed. So this way, you know, what these two measures do is they try and smooth out all of the data from the transactioning from the transactions that are happening. And the key takeaway here is that these are tracking general price movement for your typical home in the cities that we're going to be looking at here. And for that reason, you know, they're deemed to be a pretty good reliable indicator as to how the real estate market is performing. Uh, and by performing, I mean, how is the value of the underlying asset uh, tracking and moving over time? Awesome. So like I said, we moved in HPI, uh, we lend in Ontario and Alberta. So we have some HPI data over the two provinces. <clears throat> now, this is all very general information. When people say the Canadian housing market or the provincial real estate housing market, it makes me want to scream because real estate is a hyper local good. And that what's happening on one side of the street right now might not be happening on the other side of the street because it's a different community. So bear in mind, this is all very generic information um, and that what is happening in different communities is going to vary because, you know, you can have really desirable neighborhoods that are still going to see price appreciation in tough markets. And you're going to see others where they're going to be more correlated with overall movements. Um, so, so keep that in mind. This is just some information to interpret what's happening out there right now. Um, if we look at the graph on the left first, uh, we see uh, in Alberta a big spike um, <clears throat> that is basically when money became almost free. We were in deeply negative rate territory for a while uh, when capital is cheaper, i.e. mortgage funds, you can qualify for more house and then people are going to go and shop more. So we see that. Same thing in Ontario too. We see a peak probably at about a year ago, you know, depending on the city or the community that you were in, prices were observed to peak uh, between February and March of last year. And then 425 basis points later, between now and then, um, has really impaired borrowers and buyers' ability to qualify for home. Well, of course, the value of the homes has capitalized the increased cost of mortgage capital. And now we're seeing that that has a negative impact uh, on value. So we did see a correction, but interesting to note that we're still above where we were pre-pandemic. So this was actually somewhat of a healthy uh, price correction uh, is what many economists are saying. And if you look towards the, the end of these red lines, uh, we're seeing a slight uptick in values again, and, um, and values are starting to you know, stabilize again. Um, depending on on which data points you look at, uh, some of my my favorite is RBC. I think they do the best job reporting on this stuff. Um, but sales activity is increasing. Uh, the February data is starting to come in. It's looking encouraging. We're seeing month over month sales increase, and we're starting to see values increase too, uh, which is really encouraging to know that it looks like real estate might have found its footing again. Um, so have we hit the bottom? Just keep that in the back of your mind. 
Yeah, one other thing to note is that uh, this is a free tool. So if you just Google MLS um, Home Price Index, you're able to search it by um, by community. You could do the composites, you could do actual data, you could do seasonal data. So free tool, feel free to, to use it at your disposal, depending on what market you're looking to invest in. Um, perfect. They've taken the initiative. Absolutely love it. I just fired that in the chat, guys. It's a really good tool. The Korea one is my favorite. You can track HPI, you can track benchmark. Uh, so you know what's happening in your city. Okay, let's take a quick look at the two big markets in Alberta. Uh, year over year, prices are up. Uh, so Alberta did prove to be a little bit more resilient than the Ontario market. Um, Alberta was deemed to be more affordable. Uh, how housing affordability is classified is the percentage of your income that people spend on housing or the average income required to purchase your typical benchmark home. These indicators are stronger in Alberta than they are in Ontario right now. Um, new listings are down year over year uh, and inventory is low in Alberta as well. So we're still observing it to be a seller's market over here uh, in Calgary, sorry. Uh, in Edmonton, the story is a little bit different. Uh, we are seeing more inventory available on the market. Um, year over year, there is some price decline uh, from last year. Uh, Edmonton, we observed it to have peaked at around April of last year. Um, and the Calgary price trends versus what's happening in Edmonton isn't uh, super consistent. It's, it, they're not married. They're not super consistent between the two, if you will. Um, and then when you're looking at the bottom here on the Edmonton one, you have your composite, which is the aggregate of all the different types of properties. And then we separate that for single family, which is your, um, uh, what you call that blue, your blue line, if you will, your light blue. Uh, your townhouse is kind of that brownie orange line. And then your apartment style uh, was pretty much flatter, but that gives you an idea to see how different types of properties are performing in the market too. So when you're checking out that link later, make sure that you play around with it uh, to really get a sense for all the feedback that this tool can give you. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, so why is there buyer opportunity in Alberta? Um, net migration, more people coming to an area is good. Uh, there are several factors that are related, you know, economically speaking, positively correlated with the demand for real estate. Uh, the two biggest factors are population growth and population size. The more people that are in a market, the more places, you know, there needs to be more housing. And when that population grows, these people need places to live. So they buy homes. Um, uh, GDP remained relatively stable in Alberta and affordability continues to remain a bright spot. Uh, so it's not like in the GTA in Ontario where you drive until you qualify and you're commuting into Toronto from Kitchener every single day, commuting for four hours with traffic. You can live in a pretty nice community, somewhat uh, inner city in Calgary, and spend around six, uh, six seven hundred thousand dollars, and that's why um, you know affordability is viewed to be a positive here. Um, and I like the note here on the bottom too. Um, you know, we're not really expecting a big like real estate value stayed steady here, uh, and again, it speaks to affordability. Uh, it speaks to the net migration, um, and. Uh, yeah, and we're expecting more people to come here too. So again, population growth and population size and affordability uh, have been stronger, um, if you will, in holding up the real estate values and the increased mortgage rates, because of course, uh, we're not absolved from that, unfortunately, here. Yeah, as Rob mentioned before, we, we do get a lot of our, our data from RBC. We find it to be a, a great, credible source. They have fantastic newsletters. Like if you just Google RBC newsletter, you can pick it on real estate, um, macroeconomics, whatever interests you. So um, highly recommend if, if you are interested in economics, real estate, whatever the case may be, uh, they do have a fantastic newsletter if, you, if you'd like to subscribe. Perfect. Okay, now let's look at some, um, what's happening in some of the bigger markets in Ontario right now. KW was pretty slippery. 
Uh, reason for that being is, you know, the bulk of your activity, um, a lot of these people commuted into Toronto and at the start of the pandemic, prices here went up because you get a bigger home, you can get a yard, you get to get a bigger house, still commute in. Um, and people prioritized working from home. Maybe they were okay with a bigger commute at that time because of the purchasing that was available in Kitchener that creates, created a bunch of increase in demand. Um, so when you see those spikes and then you see those big corrections, uh, that's kind of what fueled that. Um, right now, when we're looking at average days on market, uh, which is an indicator as to how quickly homes are being scooped up or entered into uh, purchase and sale contracts, right now we're looking at 20 days, which is still pretty quick, I would say. Uh, if we're comparing that to a year ago, though, properties were only on the market for an average of eight days. Uh, so that's a significant increase from how quick things were moving a year ago. Uh, that said, a year ago, the market was just absolutely white hot. Um, and, and average single days, eight days on market is, is pretty fast. Uh, average month supply. This is an indicator. Basically, the way that I just say this is how much inventory is on the shelf. Um, how many homes are available to be purchased? Uh, 1.2 months, that's up 140 from last year. Um, that said, I would say anything around three months is considered a balanced market. And what a balanced market means is that supply is meeting demand and there's not undue stress on either the buyer or the seller. If you have low inventory, that means that the pressure is going to be more on sellers to enter into an agreement and sellers can leverage that against potential buyers. Whereas if there's a ton of inventory on the shelf, buyers have the ability to be more selective and that's typically correlated with downward pressure and values at the same time too. So less than three months, still a seller's market. Um, but again, comparing this to last year, um, that is up significantly. Um, again, we're only doing year over year comparisons right now because this is the time frame that you're that we're in. Um, I would not make comparisons to last year's market uh, at any other time though. <laughs> it's been a very unusual market the past year. Uh, we're sorry, we're seeing active listings going up, uh, of course. Um, but the encouraging thing that I'm seeing here is that prices overall appear to have found their footing. And if we're looking at single family homes, we're actually starting to see prices uh, go up again. Um, I've seen this on several of the files that I've done where we valued a property at a certain price and then people are starting to sell above our values again, um, which is really encouraging to see because that means that our clients are making more money. Um, and that, that of course really excites us, excites us and makes us happy. Greater Toronto area, the GTA. So listings are up. Um, days on market are 33 right now. That's up 200% from last year. Again, I would still say anything under 60 days is still a pretty quick exposure period. I understood that things do typically move faster in Toronto though. And then sales are down uh, roughly 47% from last year. Again, uh, a year ago, the market was as hot as it's ever been. Um, so these comparisons uh, perhaps might not be the, uh, the best benchmark. I think what I'm really encouraged at though, when I look at this is I see that prices have stabilized and then they're starting to go back up again. Um, so again, uh, we see in KW, we saw in Alberta that homes are starting to find their footing. Same with KW in Toronto, again, found its footing, starting to creep back up again now. Um, and what that is starting to signal is buyer confidence returning uh, to the market and that real estate assets are going to start performing again. Um, and I think that's somewhat linked to buyers having some confidence that rates are pretty much probably as high as they're going to go. Um, and this is kind of the new, the new normal and people have started to accept that. Okay, let's look at some other markets now. Uh, Windsor, uh, listings are down, sales are down, um, and we're seeing, uh, you know, months of supplies up significantly, of course, in this market as well. I'd still say we're in a balanced, uh, situation there. Um, Ottawa has been kind of in, uh, different, um, 
and that this area didn't see as big of price corrections as other ones did, primarily due to their labor sector or their primary employment industries in that area. A lot of government workers uh, who probably weren't impacted as much um, there. Uh, listings in Hamilton are down. Months of supply uh, is up to 2.1 months. Uh, and days on market uh, is up almost 320%. Again, we're still around that, mar that month uh, to sell a property though, which isn't that bad. Uh, and then the data is similar in London. So again, when we're doing these year over year comparisons from last year, uh, people were buying property sight unseen without conditions um, in multiple bidding scenarios or returning to a normal market is basically the takeaway that is what I'm feeling here. So as a real estate investor, though, what does all this information mean for you? We're starting to see that some prices are starting to stabilize. Uh, we're seeing more inventory. This means that there's more opportunity. Um, so this means that you have the ability to get selective on your purchasing, your buy side criteria. Flippers make money on the buy. If I buy a house and I buy it for 500 and put 50 grand into it, but Ryan spends 450 and puts 50 grand into it, a similar house, Ryan's going to be 50 grand ahead. So right now in these areas, there is inventory to look at. While it's not, while there's not a ton of inventory, there's more inventory than there's been in a long time. Um, so this is an opportunity to take advantage of. And we appear to be at the end of the price decline, um, which is good. We saw that in the benchmark. We saw that in the HPIs. So we're starting to see real estate find its footing again. I've said that several times today, um, but when you look at the data, that is what it is telling us. Um, and there's still a long-term, we still have a long-term issue of housing uh, supply on our hands. Uh, Canada has the least amount of housing per capita in the G7. Um, so the less supply that there is overall for people, that means that there's just going to be upward pressure on values. Um, and on top of all of this, we have and maintain our aggressive immigration targets, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, that also means that our population is going to be growing and our population size is going to be going up. So if we extract all of this out, we see right now there's some opportunity to buy. We see that the data is telling us that the price corrections have somewhat stabilized and are starting to slowly appreciate again that we don't have a ton of housing long-term overall, and that there are some factors indicating that there's gonna be more upward price pressure on real estate again shortly. Um, and if we look at, sorry, uh, Ryan, can you go back to that other slide? Um, we're kind of, you know, they call it the terminal rate. Uh, that's where they, that's what economists call the high end of the rate or the expected rate. Um, the highest rate uh, for that cycle, if you will. So we're looking at the bond rates and we're looking at the overnight rate right now. Um, just so you guys know, bond rates are associated with fixed mortgages. Overnight rate are associated with variable mortgages. The more expensive mortgages are, the less homes that people buy. Stated very simply. Um, we, are at the, we are at the peak, <laughs> or at least that's what everybody believes. And no matter what forecast you look at, um, Everybody's predicting that capital is at its peak and it could actually get shorter or it could actually become less expensive, uh, which would again encourage people to start consuming real estate again. Uh, this RBC one that was put out about a week ago is showing that they are forecasting uh, the overnight rate to start to go down towards the end of this year or the start of next year, depending on how you look at that. And bond rate, bond yields are actually starting to go down as well now, too. We can go to the next one, Ryan. Now, it has been a very, very interesting week. Um, ATB put out uh, put this out. Uh, this is their projected policy rate evolution. Um, anybody here on the call uh, heard of or knows about Silicon Valley Bank and what happened there? Yeah. Yeah. So, 
So the United States sneezes and Canada gets a cold. We're a smaller economy and everything that happens with us is downstream with them to a degree. Um, and also we had a, we have SBB here in Toronto from what I, uh, what I looked into. So we're, I would say directly correlated in some, in some sense, just not as much as the US obviously. Yeah. Thanks for that, Eli. Um, so a bank went under for people who don't know. Um, they they were the 16th largest bank in the United States, I think. They had about a little bit over 200 billion in assets. Um, they invested heavily in uh, in Fed notes and mortgages and cheap debt. Um, people started uh, needing their money again. So what banks do is they take deposits, they lend it out, and then they invest in different types of instruments. Uh, the very quick summary of what happened is, they started buying a lot of bonds that became worthless. They needed liquidity. They were selling their bonds at a loss. They told their shareholders that they needed to raise a little bit of money. And then um, their shareholders and their, uh, their clients got nervous. And then they did a bank run where people tried to get out $46 billion in one day. Um, and they couldn't meet all the requests uh, for the redemptions or withdrawals, if you will. So anyways... Um, the implications of that is that the Fed came out and they've guaranteed that uh, other depositors and banks um, that they're going to guarantee um, their, 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 the depositors, if you will. And the reason why they're doing that is so that other banks don't start selling their bonds and putting more bank runs and putting more downward pressure on the bond market. Uh, so what does all that mean, basically? And I did a very poor job of explaining in that, by the way. Apologies. Um, but the credit market is linked to bond rates, which is linked to mortgages, which is linked to real estate activities, uh, which is linked to how prices are affected. Um, so on the 8th, people were initially thinking that the Bank of Canada rate uh, could maybe get a little bit higher. And then on the 10th, it's like, uh, you know, it's probably going to stay a little bit flat. And now people are thinking that the overnight rate in Canada could go down shortly. Um because there is, because of what's happening. Um, so no matter which set of data you're looking at, um, you know, most people, most economists, macro economists, most banks believe that we're at the top and that capital is gonna become cheaper again soon. Okay, risk and rule markets. Um, we don't like lending in rural markets and we try and advise our real estate clients um, away from doing business in these types of areas as well. And we'll tell you why. Um, if you look at rural populations, uh, I like this graph here that Ryan put together. Um, in 2016, 1.8 million. In 2021, 1.8 million. We're not seeing a ton of growth in these areas um, at all. And as we talked about before, population growth and population size are uh, is, is probably the two are probably the two biggest factors um, that are correlated with real estate values. You don't want to be in an area where there's not a lot of people buying real estate. Uh, less than one in five Canadians live in a rural area. Um, so again, swim in the swim in the pond with the most fish. Uh, buy real estate, sell real estate, where there's gonna be more people, try and stick away from uh, rural markets because there's not, there's not enough buyers there. There's not a lot of people there. Awesome. Um, so I'll do the next couple, uh, I'll do the next few slides, Ryan. You, you'll take over at the wholesalers. Does that work for you? Yeah, yeah, it works for me. Perfect. So I'll give you guys some insight as to how we look at deals and what some of the due diligence is that we do. We've talked a lot about population areas and urban markets. Um, we are really focused on areas that are urban, that have at least 100,000 people. We will also look at markets with 50,000 people and 10,000 people. Anything less than that, we tend to shy away from it because we just don't see properties moving as quickly. Um, as a flipper, that means that you could hold it longer. Um, 
So we, we tend to like those areas less. So minimum 10,000, but we like the big markets more. Then we're gonna look at the property itself. Uh, is this a residential property? We do multifamilies, but the ones that we can provide the fastest service on are four doors and less. Is the value under 1.5 million? Um, reason being is that we can do internal valuations uh, up to 1.5 million in house within a business day, anything over $1.5 million, we have to get an appraisal on it. Um, but the other thing to note too, is, you know, unless you're in downtown Vancouver or downtown Toronto, your average home is going to be less than 1.5 million. So we strongly counsel real estate investors to work in the price, not only work in markets where there's a lot of people and there's population growth, uh, but within that stay in the housing areas where the most properties are transacting. And we'll, we actually have this information available to you on our economic report. Um, and I'll post a link into that afterwards. But the reason being is you wanna be working not only in areas with a lot of people, but you wanna target properties that are transacting most frequently because then you're putting yourself in a position where, where you'll be able to sell quicker than if you go to a high-end home. Um, further to that point, high-end homes are also the more susceptible to price movement because it's tougher to value one. One buyer might look at a two million, might look at a high-end property and think it's worth two million. Another person might go, "Eh, I'm only going to offer 1.5." And having that 25% discrepancy can actually really harm a real estate investor, of course. The other thing we're going to look at is: Are there any marketability concerns? Again, focusing on how quickly this property can sell. Uh, are you in front of a traffic collector? Are you backing a highway? Are you directly in front of a commercial um, enterprise or a business? Are you backing a cemetery? Um, are you surrounded by other similar homes? Or are you the weird duck on the street? Uh, that's a super uni uh, unique property. Um, are there power lines on your house? Um, are you in a floodplain? We look at everything to make sure that uh, we don't think a buyer could ding your property for. You know, we we do a lot of that due diligence for you. So if we like the property and we think that it's good, uh, that should give you some comfort knowing that we beat it up pretty hard. And if we see something, uh, we're gonna let you know right away. So you know, if we think it's a big deal uh, or a minor deal, we'll tell you why. And, uh, and we can counsel you on strategy and how to mitigate that, uh, especially if we still approve the deal and if we believe in the deal because we view a market, uh, if we view a marketability concern. Um, we're also gonna look at loan to value. So we wanna be below 80% loan to value. And what that means is that the value of the mortgages uh, on the, or of our mortgage on the property cannot be more than 80% of the as complete. Now, depending on the market and depending on the property, this will set our loan to value ceiling um, off of different factors, but it has to be less than 80. Typically in Ontario right now, we're at that 70% mark, but as prices are starting to stabilize, uh, we are tracking that data uh, whenever it's available to us. And I think in the coming months, uh, we might be looking to increase it again, closer towards that 80% mark again. We're also gonna be looking at the comparable sales. So not only are we looking at the property, but we're looking at what's happening around your property. So uh, is your property similar to these other properties? Um, how are these properties selling? What are they selling for? Uh, what is a recommendation that we could give to you based off of what we're seeing with the comparables? Um, are you looking at the market and seeing how that could uh, impact that? Um, moreover, we're also gonna look at inventory as well. So here's what's sold, that's historical data. Current data is what's happening right now, looking at the inventory. So if you are a flipper, you're looking at the comparable sales to see what's happened, uh, to see what's happened. But when you're getting ready to list your property, you also got to look at inventory. So you can, you know, come up with a strategy to be to come up with a strategy to be competitive with, with what's on the market right then. Uh, we'll then also look at your exit strategy. So are you going to be selling it or are you going to be right refinancing it? We touched a little bit on the sales side, so I won't uh, talk about that again. Uh, if you're going to be refinancing it, we'll work with you and or your mortgage broker on what refinancing could look like. 
Um, so if it's a burr, what kind of rental offsets are we looking at? If you're putting it in your personal name, um, you know, what does your income situation look like? If you're with a really good broker, great. If not, we can connect you with somebody who can help you out. We want to make sure that your exit strategy is looked after so you can leverage private capital efficiently, where that's entering a, pro a property, entering an opportunity, potentially higher leverage, potentially a property that's not going to qualify with a bank or close on time with a bank and then realize your financial benefit. And then we help graduate you back into conventional financing. Uh, so you're in an improved position. Um, we also consider what credit will be required, of course. So in addition to income, in addition to property, all the other things we're looking at credit too. So if we see an opportunity to counsel you on some credit rehabilitation between now and then, we can give you some tips and tricks to help make you nice and shiny for the next lender as well. Uh, some of the other things that we'll consider is, do you have enough capital to execute? So do you have your down payment? Do you have your renovation costs? Uh, can you carry? Can you close? Again, that's part of our feasibility analysis. We're not going to put you in the loan that we do not think that you can perform it. Um, and then we're going to look to see if there's anything that could help, anything else that could impact the success of the loan. Is there, are there any tax obligations to the CRA? Um, what's your filing cadence with the CRA? Uh, does your business plan make sense? Is the deal profitable? Do we have good, uh, do we have complete information in your application? Uh, is credit good? Do we have notice of assessments? When we're lending to a corporate borrower, do we understand what the corporation does, who its shareholders are, and what it does in its course of business? Um, are we sharing contents of the uh, appraisal and valuation back to you? And uh, another really important factor too is are we working with you on uh, are we working with you on contingency planning? Um, very rarely do things go to plan. We build in buffers. We communicate these buffers to you. When things come up, we're happy to counsel you through that as well. There's a lot of private money out there, guys. Um, and we are just one option. Uh, we'd love to be your first option, your go-to option, because if we don't think that we're the best option for you, we'll let you know. Um, but shopping is a part of the process. We completely understand that. So when you're working with your broker or when you're working with other private lenders, how do you know that they're credible? Uh, some of the things that you should consider are, um, you know, are they an established corporation that has Google reviews, that has a reputation that's been in business for a long time? Or are they an, an individual private lender? If they're an individual private lender, get a sense for um, you know, how long that they've been lending it out. What's your experience in real estate? Uh, can you chat with some brokers who have brokered some of their deals before so you can get a sense for who they are, how they operate? That's very important. Research reputation, Google reviews, uh, Google searches, talk with as many people as you can. Have uh, your lawyer review their commitment letter. Anything over $75,000, guys, needs to have two lawyers, one acting on behalf of the lender, one acting on behalf of the purchaser. Make sure that you're having your broker or your mortgage agent and your lawyer reviewing everything with you and for you. So you understand what's in the documentation, you understand what you're signing up for, and you understand what risk assume, um, is within. You can always ask for references too. Um, you know, can you put me in touch with some of your borrowers? Uh, can you put me in touch with some brokers that you work with? Um, again, making sure that this is somebody that you'd be comfortable entering into a business agreement with. Uh, mortgage investment corporations are going to get their money from, you know, equity, which is shareholders, uh, and also uh, financial institutions like us. Uh, we have a line of credit uh, with several different banks. Um, so reputable, um, uh, reputable, reliable source of capital. Um, if you're dealing with an individual, uh, ask them, where's your money coming from? Um, cause nothing's worse than going to instruct on closing day and the money's not there. Uh, so making sure that they are well capitalized, that you understand where it comes from, that it makes sense to you, um, that you are comfortable, uh, entering into an agreement with that lender and you're confident that the funds are going to show up when they need to. Um, that's a very important thing. 
Also understanding how many loans do they have in the market. So again, this is going to speak to their, uh, how they manage, their reputation, of course, uh, and how reliable of a source of capital and how many other people are doing business with them as well. And then also, you know, have they ever foreclosed or power of, of sale? And what does that look like? You want to work with somebody who is committed to solutions, not somebody who's just going to hit you with a hammer this, the first chance that they can get. Um, is this person able to be forward thinking in how they look at uh, enforcement options? And what I mean by that is come up with solutions, be willing to communicate with you for the benefit of both parties. Um, so again, you know, we'd love to be your first call. Uh, if we're not the best option, we'll let you know. And when you're talking to other private lenders, just consider some of these things to make sure that you're putting yourself in a good situation. And then what to do with you when you're in trouble in a private loan. Uh, a lot of the time, private mortgages have shorter maturity dates, uh, meaning the terms are going to be shorter. We deal in six-month terms. I've seen private mortgages be as short as 90 days. Um, so when things happen, they can happen quickly. It's, and trouble can look like many things. It can be missed payments. It can be downward pressure on property values, although I think we're past that now. Uh, it can be your renovations are getting delayed. Um, whatever else it may be that's giving you some discomfort about your private loan and its situation, reach out for help immediately. Talk to your broker, talk to your lender. Here's what I'm up against. Here's what I'm uncomfortable about. Uh, give them an idea if you have one. Also ask them if they have any suggestions or if there's anything that you can do. Also reach out to some friends or some family. Um, people can be really resourceful. Uh, friends and family could be a good resource. You know, if they want to come in on the project and help out, um, if they're interested in supporting you in the business opportunity, there could be some, um, some chance there. Another thing that we've seen people do is restructure debt. So just because you have one property that's a little bit tricky, or maybe you ran out of money or renovations went over schedule. If you have another property, you can look at rewriting the entire set of mortgages uh, to make the lender secure and to give you enough capital to see the project to completion, be that deal with the rears, deal with renos, whatever that is. Um, there's opportunities to do that. Um, also, uh, when you're looking at it, when you're working with a mortgage broker, they can be looking at your entire portfolio and analyzing the properties and analyzing the financing on them to make sure that you're leveraging efficiently. And what that means is you have the capital, you ha you're in mortgages that are the best for you. Um, so maybe it's taking a bigger loan on a property that has more equity because that one's cash flowing, replacing some of the smaller, more high expensive debt, whatever that is, uh, a good mortgage professional is going to be able to talk you through that. You're also going to want to consider selling, uh, depending on what your situation is. Some people try and hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, sometimes it's just better to sell. Because the sooner that you act in a sales situation, the more money that you can put back in your pocket at the end of the day, which is what the which is what it's all about. But the lasting thing that I would state here is you need to act quickly. Um, I have had a, a, it's been a tough year. Let's let's just be really open and honest about this, guys. I've dealt with a ton of real estate investors this past year who have been in some tricky situations. The common theme uh, for most people who found themselves in a tricky situation is they didn't do what they said that they were going to do. They didn't do the renovations. They didn't sell quickly. Uh, they listed, but they didn't list sharp. Um, commit to your plan. Act quickly. Act fast. Act now. Get it done. Um, and if you're in help or if you're in a tricky situation, reach out to people right away. The sooner that people know about problems, the more opportunity that they have to help you. If we wait and things get dragged on and there's uh, and problems compound, then there's less opportunity to help. And then it just becomes more expensive for everybody. Um, so again, do what you say you're going to do, act fast. And here are some other tips within that. Fantastic. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, all the context and, uh, and, and great data, Rob. 
Um, so these are the list of the wholesalers that we see a lot of really good buying opportunities with. I'll put this in the chat. Oh, did it copy and paste correctly? If not, this will get sent out at the end, uh, end of the call. I thought it just would have been a nice, quick and easy copy and paste. Um, but yeah, this will be sent out. These are wholesalers, got, have them categorized by um, just the region. So on the left-hand side, we have wholesalers in Ontario um, that we see deals on a daily basis come through, um, come through these wholesalers. And then on the right-hand side, we have wholesalers based in, uh, in Alberta here that uh, we see some really good buying opportunities um, that we know that they're, they're reputable. We've, we've done deals with, so we can speak to their credibility um, and their ease of experience when it comes to funding their deals and uh, having really good buying opportunities. No, we blasted through quite a bit. Um, if anyone has any questions, you will 100% be getting a copy of this presentation. Um, more than happy to set some time aside right now. Uh, if you want to put your questions in the chat or if you just want to unmute yourself, feel free to do that. And uh, we're more than happy to spend a few minutes on answering some of your questions. If no questions come up, I got the back half of the presentation just reviewing our, our financing products that we have. If you're familiar with our financing products, that's awesome. Feel free to, to jump off. But for those of you who are looking to understand a little bit more about what we do. Um, the back half, uh, around 15 minutes, will be dedicated toward that. So got a question here. Do you guarantee a mortgage if using these wholesalers? So we, we don't guarantee a mortgage. The first thing that we're going to do whenever we are uh, looking at a wholesale deal is, number one, we're going to um, underwrite the borrower and ensure that once we have an application, we'll be pulling credit from the borrower and their notice of assessments if they're borrowing in their personal name. Uh, if they're borrowing in a corporation, then we'll look at all their corporate docs. Um, and what we're looking for primarily there is that they don't owe any tax, they have capital in order to execute on the project um, and that they have um, uh, a credit score above 500. Once we know that we'll lend to the client, then we look at the deal so say if you have a deal in uh, in Brampton, for example, you're going to be buying for 800, putting 50,000 into it and selling it for uh, 1 million. We just want to make sure that the deal is profitable. So we don't guarantee that we'll 100% fund these deals. As long as the deal is profitable and you've proven yourself um, reliable of borrowing our capital, then we uh, essentially draw up a mortgage as long as we verify the exit strategy uh, it's in a location that we lend, you have the capital, then uh, uh, we go through our underwriting process. So long-winded answers, we don't guarantee uh, mortgaging these uh, these wholesale deals. As long as you're, um, as long as everything checks out on the deal in yourself, then we then we uh, issue a commitment letter. Hopefully that answers your your question. No, it uh, was kind of a longer one. Um, question number two, what is the a typical investor experience you're looking for. So we have a whole wide range of real estate investors that we deal with. Uh, uh, some of our more experienced clients are doing, you know, 10, 11 properties at once. We lend to first time flippers uh, all the time as well too. So if you're looking to get into real estate investing, we're more than happy to just lend our time, our resource and our expertise. Um, as Rob mentioned before, the first thing that, um, that our number one underwriting criteria is taking a look at profitability. So we have a really handy Excel spreadsheet tool that I'll be going into uh, in the back end half of this call. This will also be get, getting sent out to you as well too. So as long as you have a profitable deal, you have the capital to execute the flip that you're looking to do or the burr. It's in a location that we lend. We have confidence in your business plan to execute the, the, the flip. Um, and, and it meets all of our underwriting criteria. If you're a first-time real estate investor, we, uh, we're more than happy to, to lend to you. Um, would it be better to speak to you before submitting an offer on, on the wholesale deal? Uh, Raki, 100% yes. We always recommend clients getting pre-approved with us before um, you're essentially going to put offers out into the market. The reason for that is we just confirm number one that we'll lend to you. 
And number two, it really helps with providing you a quicker, quicker response once you do find a real estate deal in order to give you and the wholesaler uh, a quicker answer. So 100% recommend that you reach out, get pre-approved, um, and then we can provide you with a more timely response once you start looking at uh, wholesale deals. Once you do have a wholesale deal that you're interested in, using another example, say you're going to buy one off Bliss Realty, it's in Brampton, um, <clears throat> and saying that you're already pre-approved with us, all that we would need is the buyer's package from Bliss. Proof of funds, showing us that you have enough capital from the project for, for the flip from start to finish. A renovation summary, just outlining what you're planning on doing to the property. Once we have that information, I would hand that off to our appraiser. They would pull comps, taking into consideration what's most recently sold. Um, so they'd be pulling comps uh, on an as complete basis, ensuring that they're comparing apples to apples using the direct comparison approach. The typical turnaround time for that is 24 business hours. Once the valuation comes back, everything checks out. We confirm that you're making money on your flip. We would write a, uh, we would drop a commitment letter uh, confirming that we would uh, fund the deal. Lots of questions. Love, love the conversation. <clears throat> Basically, uh, I'm a newcomer and I am keen on investing on real estate. Uh, is there any chance we can work together? Uh, so we have an internal policy where we are only able to lend to uh, Canadian citizens or permanent residents of Canada. Uh, if you meet any of those two qualifications, would love to have uh, would love to have the uh, the conversation. Feel free to reach out. Sorry, I meant to ask. Assuming all other things check out, credits are there any areas that you will not underwrite in, uh, as in certain areas, towns? Yes. So. Um, if the population's under 10,000, we will not look to lend there. There's a few caveats to that. Uh, currently, right now, we do not lend in Timmins, Ontario, or Sudbury, Ontario, um, in, in, in that market. The reason being is we don't have MLS access there. Uh, we have MLS access to pretty much every other market uh, in Ontario. So if internally we don't have MLS access, we like having the data um, to do our valuations. Then, uh, then we don't lend there if we don't have MLS access. Feel free to reach out. If you have a specific market that you're looking to invest in, I can more than happy to jump on a call uh, or shoot me an email to uh, answer your specific questions related to the, the cities that you're looking to invest in. Do you have any cities where multifamily duplexes properties are below 250K? Uh, Fanny, sorry, uh, apologize, apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, but um, I would honestly say uh, more, uh, even though it isn't our focus of lending, more rural areas. I know Northern Ontario, I'm not too sure the city or province that you're in, um, you know, North Bay, uh, Sudbury, I don't think you could maybe get one nowadays for under 250. I know Timmins, you could for sure get one under uh, 250 for a duplex there. Um, it's just those more northern parts of, of Ontario where um, purchase prices are um, tend to be cheaper just due to population requirements and demand. Can you confirm which areas in Ontario that you do not lend in? For example, uh, spoke on to uh, answer that question uh, a little bit uh, before previously. Ian, uh, what do you think will happen now that banks reported the percentage of mortgages hitting the trigger rate uh, at about 25 to 30% of total mortgages? Will power of sale drop off now that banks are kicking uh, principal payments down the road? Um, so on that note, Maeve, I'm not too sure if you're still on the call. I know you're a little bit more focused on the underwriting component um, when it comes to you know refinances uh, and what you're seeing. Uh, with the top brokers that you typically speak with on a daily basis to provide some input? Yeah, I don't, you know, it's tough to say. I know that a lot, uh, what the banks have started to do is, you know, we've talked about those trigger rates. And now what even some banks are doing now too is they're just making the payment the same. And then uh, with the payment that's no longer sufficient to amortize a loan, they're just capitalizing that. So adding it to the balance. So people are making monthly payments and their balances are actually going up because the interest rate is not sufficient to amortize the loan past its max amortization. So I've heard of some banks increasing principal balances because the payment is no longer sufficient because they don't want to create a payment risk by increasing the payment so much where they fear that they could no longer collect. Um, 
So I have heard of a few major banks doing that. Um, I haven't seen it happen because I haven't looked at a lot of that, nor am I involved in their management. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, but if true, I believe that that's a measure for them just to kind of manage their ongoing risk. Um, Perfect. I don't think we're going to be in this environment too, too much longer, though. Um, we're starting to see, you know, SVB was really the first um, things break <laughs> with how levered everything is now. Th things break when capital is this expensive, and we're starting to see that happen. Appreciate uh, appreciate the response, Maeve. Uh, Ian, part two of your question, what markets in Ontario do you see good opportunities for flips? Um, where we see good opportunities is honestly wherever you can buy a deal. Uh, Rob touched on it before, but um, buying right or buying below market value is the number one success factor that we see on a daily basis. So, you know, uh, if the if the market value of a property is 500, you're buying the property through a wholesaler at, you know, 480, 475 whatever the number is, just working in that buffer of getting it below market value. Uh, where we see a lot of these good opportunities arise is, is through these wholesalers. Um, so highly recommend getting on uh, on their buyers list. I was able to copy and paste it in the chat. So then you're able to, so then you're able to click uh, just right on the links there. So it's um, a lot more simple and convenient, but no real specific markets. It's wherever you can buy a property below uh, below market value. Uh, I've spoken to some, I've spoken to some brokers who often suggest your products. Uh, do I have to go through them or can I work with you directly? Um, so on that note, like if you are working with a broker, uh, always recommend, um, maintaining that relationship and continuing to work with that broker, um, just in order to ensure that you're obviously best served. Um, with that said, if if you don't currently have a broker, um, more than happy to work with you direct. It, it doesn't matter. It's completely whatever makes most sense uh, for your specific situation. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, it's Ellie here. Uh, so regarding going back to your last question, uh, sorry for the background noise as well. Um, so in regards to what markets in Ontario do you see good opportunities for flips? So you touched on that, but are there any like, regarding applications that are coming your way right now where mm -hmm. are you getting majority of the good flips or applications from what, what yeah, markets it's... are you seeing it in? are you seeing it in greater toronto area are you seeing it more in new market or more in like what areas in particular right so that way when i speak to my realtor me and him can essentially look into specific areas and find specific opportunities right for sure so definitely southwestern ontario it really depends on who the seller is to, to, to be honest. Um, if they're willing to sell at like at or below market value. Um, so primarily Southwestern Ontario, kind of the outskirts within the city limits, you know, Kitchener, Waterloo, sometimes Ottawa, um, may have any other region specifically, but it's mainly wherever you can buy a property below market value. So it, it just really depends on the specific deal as opposed to the specific location. If you are focused on a specific market, like it's definitely a wait, a wait and see type of game. Um, I know these wholesalers spend a lot of money on, on marketing um, directly from the sellers. So those, those markets, I know Northern Ontario is, is, as well too um was quite popular about about a year or so ago uh just due to the purchase prices being uh, significantly lower but most so these parties... links these links sorry to interrupt these links that yeah. you put that, that, that are on the screen right over here if i was to click on them these are essentially wholesale deals where i would be able to go and look at those flips potentially yeah so you would click to join their buyers list yeah. whenever these wholesalers have a property under contract they create marketing material that has property photos, comps, uh, property details, uh, and it gives an overview on when it's closing, you know, uh, obviously location, photos, um, suggested renovation, lot okay. size. So, bed, this, so this would be good to provide to my realtor then, so that way he can keep, in, uh, keep a lookout for this. Yeah, for sure. Up. So whenever these wholesalers have properties that they get under contract, they send it out to people on their email list. So they are not on the MLS. They're, they're off market. 
So the, the buyer pool for these properties are significantly less because they're not on the MLS. Exactly. Thank you. Appreciate it. Another, another thing I would add to that, guys, about location is, you know, we've, we've, we've beaten up the kind of size of markets that you want to be in and that you're working with uh, or working with a property, you know, that entry to mid-level property, whatever that price point is per that city, because you have, you have people buying, you know, entering the housing market and you have people downsizing. So you're getting kind of demand from two sides. The other thing I would say though, for, ge uh, you know, geography, if you will, is you want to be at a place where you can manage it. So if it's not an area that you can't manage it, do you have somebody that you trust that can manage it? I've talked with people who spend their whole day driving from Peterborough to Barrie to Hamilton to Windsor, and they're managing all these different flips, and it just sounds terrible. Um, so also be cognizant of project management, because if a project is not managed properly, it will fail. Um, so if you can't manage it comfortably within your schedule, make sure that you have a trusted team member that can. And if you don't have that in, uh, in the area where the opportunity may lie, then I would urge you to reconsider that. Yeah, really good, really good note, Rob. Um, something that we see people who do manage out of province is they work with their contractors and they get video updates uh, in real time once, twice a week, just to ensure that they're managing the project efficiently and they're actually seeing updates uh, on a consistent basis. So ensuring that you're doing virtual walkthroughs um, the more, the better, um, just so you're able to hold, you know, everyone that's involved accountable for, uh, for the project to, to push forward. Uh, Fanny, any comments on Cornwall, Ontario markets? Uh, we do lend there. Uh, we get quite a few inqu inquiries from Cornwall. I know obviously it, it borders the U S uh, purchase prices and rental demand. Um, we, in the past, I've seen a lot of opportunity in that market. We have quite a few investors who do focus, specifically on the on the on the Cornwall market. So we have had uh, quite a bit of demand for for that specific uh, for that specific city. Cornwall's um, been resilient this last year, guys. Um, that's the one thing that I would say is it did it was not as exposed to price corrections as other areas in the Ontario market. Um, and I have had success lending in there in there. Uh, Ian, some markets tolerate higher after repair values. How do I source them? Um, not too sure I understand the question. Um, some markets tolerate higher. So I'm assuming you're maybe talking about like a Tobacco um, in, and, in and around the GTA. It just really depends on like looking at the, the market average specifically within that community and understanding what the typical finishings are, if they're low, medium, or, or, or high end grade, um, ensuring that you're just renovating to the market average, uh, the market average standard as well too, is what we see clients being really successful at. If you over renovate, you spend too much on renovations, you're, you're trying to be on the higher end within a market average community. That's where we've seen uh, clients in the past spend more than what was required um, and, and spend a lot more on renovations that don't really warrant that higher after repair value. So um, I, I definitely get in contact with a realtor in the specific market that you're looking to, uh, to flip in. Whenever you're working with a realtor, I find it significantly helps working with a realtor who first-handedly invests in the specific asset class that you're looking to purchase in. So if you're buying duplexes, triplexes, um, working with a realtor who also owns duplexes, triplexes, is focusing on the Burr strategy just because they have first-hand experience um, sourcing, uh, managing tradespeople, and um just having firsthand ex experience with the type of investment strategy that you're uh, that you're focusing on. Najib, um, what is your lender fees if someone works with you directly instead of working with a mortgage broker? Uh, so I have our fees coming up uh, and our rates in in the next slide. I didn't think that we'd be getting so many questions, which, which is a good good sign. Uh, but they range depending on the market from one to three percent, uh, depending on the province. Uh, I look for regions uh, with new industry investment, new factories, head or head office locations. When will you start providing services uh, in other provinces or the U.S.? 
Uh, we're looking to start lending in BC. This has been our on our um, bucket list or to do list for for a little while now. We don't have a definitive date for for that market. It'll probably be about a year or so. Um, we're creating our business plan currently for that market. We still see a lot of opportunity in Ontario. Uh, we just started lending in Ontario about three years ago, so we still feel that that market. Um, we've just scratched the surface, so there's lots of opportunity in that in that market. Uh, U.S. that won't be for uh, that won't be for quite a few years to come, unfortunately. But that would be five years, may have saying. Um, but that would be the next market after after BC. Can we get a copy of the recording? 100%. It'll be sent out um, in the next day or two after we're done this session. I'm referring to market cap for, for home type. Um, so Ian, normally when it's, depending on the number of units that you're focusing on, like the direct comparison approach is, is typically for, for single family detached home, which is what we focus on. Cap rates, that's normally for, for multifamily uh, five units and, and up. Um, happy to, if, if you give me a, uh, if you call our main line, if you just Google uh, Calvert Home Mortgage, feel free to give me a shout later today and I can walk you through your specific question uh, after this meeting. Thanks for all the info. What kind of interest rates do you have? Uh, I'll get into that in just a sec. Is it, uh, as a mix, is it a requirement for you to work with borrowers through mortgage brokers? Nope. Uh, Sixty-five percent of our business are through is through mortgage brokers. Uh, the other is uh, we work with clients uh, direct. Fantastic. No, uh, we are quite a bit behind behind time. Uh, seems like we have quite a few people still on the call, so I'll still walk through our uh, our flip our our financing solutions for Alberta and Ontario. Maeve, if you have other meetings and stuff like that, feel free to feel free to jump off. Perfect. So here we go. Rates, terms, fees. So we have it broken down by province. So on the left-hand side, it doesn't differ too, too much. Uh, so this is for our flip and burr financing, which makes up the majority of uh, majority of our business. Uh, so in Alberta, the minimum that we need down to purchase a property is $10,000, not 10, not 10%, literally $10,000. Obviously, that comes at a premium at uh, almost 18% on an annual basis. Uh, Ontario, it's the exact same thing. Uh, just the minimum that we need down is $20,000. And then we have a sliding scale going down with the higher the down payments that you, uh, you put down. All of our commitments are drawn up for six months fully open. Uh, we require monthly interest-only payments. There's a no renewal fee option and there's no prepayment penalty. Uh, I think the quickest payout that we had was just a few days. So if you borrow our capital, uh, you have a mortgage for five days, you're literally charged five days interest. There's no prepayment pre penalty, discharge fees, administrator fees, uh, nothing like that. Um, I know these rates can seem uh, obviously a little daunting and uh, cause some indigestion. Uh, one thing to take into consideration is that private capital, especially for flipping, the, the intention is always to be very short term. 80% uh, of our mortgages pay uh, out within that six to nine month range. So under a year. So this 18%, if you do do the minimum down payment, um, a more accurate depiction on how to calculate this is to divide it by 12. So to get your monthly cost of borrowing and then multiply it by the number of months that you expect to be in the loan for to get a more accurate representation. Like if you're in and out in four months, uh, that 18% is never actualized on an annual basis. Um, so just something to take into consideration whenever you are considering um, borrowing from a private lender. Uh, lender fees. So it, they do vary from province to province. Uh, our fees go up to 1.5%. Something to note whenever you are uh, looking at private loans is if the lender fee is paid up front. So on closing day. So if you had a closing on April 15th, that one and a half percent fee. Uh, on the net mortgage, is that due on closing or is it capitalized or built into the mortgage? With us, it's built into the mortgage. Uh, so it's just something that will obviously have an impact on your cash flow and capital restraints if you do have to come up with that fee on, uh, on closing day. One other thing to note uh, for those wholesalers is that all of them do have wholesale fees or assignment fees. 
what that is, is essentially their commission on the project. So let's say they get a property under contract for 500,000. They charge a $20,000 assignment fee or wholesale fee. Most other lenders that we're aware of will make you come up with that $20,000 assignment fee on closing, plus have your 20% down payment. So obviously that could be quite capital intensive. For us, in this example, we would consider the $520,000 um, cost as your purchase price. So the minimum we would need down on that is $20,000, uh, depending on depending on the market. So um, just something to take into consideration. Calvert difference. Uh, I know there are, you know, hundreds, maybe if not thousands of private lenders, private individuals lending their own capital. Um, these are kind of the, the value proposition that we we feel makes us really unique and gives us uh, a competitive advantage in the marketplace as opposed to uh, the other lenders that are out there. So um, something that a lot of people appreciate about us is just our really quick turnaround time. We are known in the marketplace for uh, really good customer service. So uh, if you're looking at a property, we're able to issue a commitment letter for very time sensitive deals. Uh, if you do have one that requires quick closing within 24 hours, um, once we have a full package, so once we've done our, all of our underwriting, then from that time frame on, we're able to issue a commitment letter within 24 hours. Um, quick funding as well too. So 24 hours from full deal submission, I'll get into what specifically entails uh, a total deal submission, but it's essentially app, credit, notice of assessments, purchase agreement, proof of funds, renovation summary. And then if you are borrowing through a corporation, uh, corporate docs as well too. Uh, no fee for our valuations. Uh, a lot of other private lenders are gonna make you get an appraisal. We do our own internal appraisals, uh, uh, sorry, our own internal valuations through our um, appraisers that we employ. We currently employ uh, a three appraisers in house. Uh, our valuations are completely free and done within 24 business hours. Uh, so if you think you can sell the property for $600,000, you're going to be buying it for $500,000, putting $25,000 into renovations. Our appraiser values the property. It comes in at five seventy-five. dollars So there's a $25,000 discrepancy between what our appraisers valued the property at and what you think you can sell the property for. Uh, we're more than happy to review our valuations. Um, and share our insights as to what we're seeing and our analysis as to why it came to that 525. So we can walk you through the comps, the adjustments that were made, um, or if there are marketability concerns as well too. So we share all of our insights and we're more than happy to help walk you through that just to increase your uh, literacy uh, and understanding on how appraisers uh, value properties using the direct comparison approach. Uh, no voicemail. We obviously do have voicemail, but uh, if you call our main line uh, at the Calvert office, if I'm not available, if Rob's not available, uh, we have a whole team that will uh, pick up your call. So we really pride ourselves on always being available um, for deals that you have that, uh, that are obviously time sensitive. Legal documentation and in-house signing. This is only for the uh, individuals on the call that are in Alberta. Um, so something that saves you, you know, a few thousand bucks, uh, as opposed to, um, going to the lawyer's office, signing everything in-house, so you're able to act, physically come into our office. We prepare all of our mortgage instructions, uh, and you're able to sign in-house for, uh, for a, a few of the deals that you have that, uh, are in the jurisdiction of, uh, of Alberta. So on the on the Ontario side, there, how would that work? We would need to have uh, we would need to have a lawyer that obviously uh, yeah. takes care of all that, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, there'll be two lawyers in Ontario. Uh, it's industry practice for the borrower to pay for the private lender's legal fees. Uh, so there'll be two two sets of lawyers. One set of lawyer representing the borrower. One set, uh, one set of lawyers representing the private lender. So we'll use an example for us, for example, the client or the borrower would pay for those two sets of legal fees. Um, we've partnered up with uh, two or three law firms in Ontario that we send all of our business to. So we've created really good relationships with these uh, few law firms. So they typically don't charge full pop just because all of the volume goes through them. Um, so you can't, you won't expect, uh, 
full full the uh, lawyer fees in, in most instances. Okay, and if I so if I if let's say I, we have a quick flip and we're gonna be going through the closing, would you be able to connect us with uh, the lawyer like the lawyer that you're a partner up with? Yep, one hundred percent, definitely. More than happy to share. You know, industry professionals, resources, insights, uh, anything help to um, either increase the financial literacy or just help real estate investors and industry professionals. So more than happy to share those. How much, how much are the lawyer fees generally with the people that you're partner with? Yeah. So the cheapest set of legal fees is when there's one property and one borrower. Uh, that's normally maybe if you have a specific number it might help but i want to say they're around 1500 to 1750 um whenever you get into multiple properties whenever you're borrowing through a corporation and there's multiple shareholders that's when the fees start to add up um so expect that to be the the, the typical cheapest cost for one set of legal fees in ontario thanks it uh, looks like we have a question from Chris. Uh, I have clients wanting to invest their funds for your programs. Do you have a minimum investment amount? Uh, not too sure if you're talking about the investment side to invest in our, our, our mortgage investment corporation. More than happy to have that conversation uh, online. If you offline, sorry, if you shoot me an email. Um, I just put my email in the chat. Feel free to reach out and we can send you some more information on investing in our fund. Uh, lending solutions. So this is an overview of what we offer in the two different markets. So uh, we are we offer limited products in the Ontario market just because it is a newer market for us. Uh, so in Alberta, uh, above and above and beyond the typical flip financing that we offer, we do have some debt consolidation, uh, equity takeout, and then short term mortgage solutions for uh, for quick closings. We call them interim purchases. So if uh, a client is buying a new pre construction. Uh, pre-construction house and a lender b lender pulled out last minute we're more than happy to help provide those clients with a short-term uh, lending solution um, for that specific product in alberta and uh, and ontario details on where we land i know rob kind of touched on it before um so it shouldn't be anything too, too familiar. So in uh, Alberta and Ontario, our focus is population is 100,000 and above. Minimum requirement is population 10,000 above with the exception of Timmins and, uh, and Sudbury. Uh, minimum loan amounts, we don't currently have any minimum. Uh, if they're borrow, if the client's borrowing under $100,000, we do have a minimum lender fee of $2,000. Uh, so it's just something to take into consideration the total cost of borrowing. Uh, if they're borrowing, you know, 65 grand, they have a $2,000 minimum lender fee. They're paying legal fees. It's just, it, obviously it can add up to be quite, uh, quite costly. Most will lend out on one property is 1.5 million. Uh, clients are able to do volume as well too. So say if you have uh, a real estate investor who's doing multiple flips uh, at once, we would we'd obviously love the opportunity and chance to win over that business. Um, we typically cap borrowers. At a, mid, at a maximum of, of $2 million um, at once. Once we've developed a reputation, once we've developed a relationship with them, we can look to increase that credit facility. Uh, we just want to make sure that, you know, loads get paid out on time, projects are completed on time, there's no cash flow if, issues, stuff along those lines. Uh, details touched on market average single family homes. Uh, we absolutely love lending to corporate borrowers for the individuals who do 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 volume. We notice that it's quite common for them to be borrowing in corporations. Uh, we just need corporate docs, um, essentially, if we're going to be lending to um, those specific clients. And what we're looking for there is that uh, they're primarily up to date on taxes um, is, the, is the primary concern that we're looking to um, look and understand. We do first and, more, first, uh, and second mortgages as well, too. We are able to go up to a higher loan to value for bridge deals. Uh, for those who are not aware of what a bridge deal is, it's essentially when you're selling a property and purchasing a property and the dates don't line up. So you're taking possession of a property sooner than when you're selling your property. So you need capital short term. Uh, we're able to go up to 85% loan to value um, on those specific deals. So higher loan to value. That's with the contingent that the property is firm sold uh, and has no conditions on, on the sale of the property. 
Uh, example, we absolutely love doing uh, flip of the months interviews as well, too. So whether you are a real estate investor uh, or you're a mortgage broker working with a real estate investor, uh, we're more than happy to jump on a call, do case studies. Uh, what went well? What would the client do differently next time? What were some key learning lessons? Um, if they have uh, an Instagram page, normally we find that it offers them value going through these case studies. So uh, if you have any ideas, suggestions, you want to do a Facebook Live, you want to do an Instagram Live to build your brand, build your mortgage business, or for your real estate investor, um, build obviously more, more, uh, more influence with using our case studies more than happy to help support. Feel free to reach out. This is a typical flip that, uh, that happened, uh, I want to say three, three months ago. So we go through the numbers here. They made a net profit of, uh, of $74,000. These were the rates terms, um, and, and the commitment fee. So we are still seeing lots of really, really great deals in the marketplace. Um, it's just, uh, really subject to where clients can get those, those, those properties, which is typically through the wholesalers. Uh, Flip Analyzer. So this is our Excel tool that we use internally to underwrite. So whenever we have a loan, uh, we run it through this Excel spreadsheet. I'm more than happy to share this tool with everyone on the call. It'll be sent out after, um, after this webinar. So you essentially populate all of your costs associated with purchasing a property on the left-hand side. Your selling costs with selling the property, which is primarily your realtor fee. Your operating costs, so electrical, gas, you know, property tax insurance. Uh, the primary variables that you will need to populate or input is your months to renovate, your months to sell, your renovation budget, what you're purchasing the property for, what your down payment is, and what the after repair value is. That's the green highlighted uh, section there. So, and then it'll automatically populate your uh, mortgage payments, how much you're paying on a daily basis. This was an Ontario deal, deal so the fee was 2%. Uh, and then what your total interest costs are. So that's your mortgage payments in this example for four months, which totals 9,300. And then the total financing costs, which is your mortgage payments plus your financing fee. So in this example, it was just under $15,000. Uh, there's also a YouTube uh, video tutorial that I uh, reviewed this analyzer in depth. Uh, if you just type in Calvert Home Mortgage Flip Analyzer, it'll pop up and I review this um, Excel spreadsheet in, uh, in a robust uh, video. Um, so this uh, with those variables, it essentially populates what your profitability is. So in this example where the client made $74,000, this was the case study that uh, that we just showed. The total cash needed that Calvert needed to verify was $167,000, uh, sorry, 167, uh, $757. Um, and that totals what we need to see for the down payment, renovations, carrying costs, operating costs, and closing costs. So before we issue a commitment letter, we needed to see that you have capacity from start to finish for the project. So we would need to see in this example, proof of funds for that amount, that can come from multiple different accounts. If you have um, $100,000 in a line of credit and $100,000 in a checking account, that would suffice. Uh, we're able to accept um, credit cards as well, too, if you have capacity on credit cards, joint venture agreements, obviously cash accounts. Um, so we are able to get quite creative. Or if you have gifted funds, as long as there's a gift letter and, and a paper trail, um, we're also able to get, uh, also able to use gifted funds for um for proof of funds. So also in the spreadsheet, it outlines the total project cost. So for the total capital invested in this project, 58% went to renovations, 22% went to selling costs, 11% went to financing, and 6% went to purchasing costs. So it's a robust spreadsheet, outlines your profitability, costs, where your capital's going. And it's just a really handy spreadsheet tool uh, in order to gauge uh, and run numbers on, on deals. So if you are looking to flip a, um, flip a property, we will require a renovation budget. So this is a, a template that we have. Uh, you'll also be getting a copy of this. It's not required to use this spreadsheet. Uh, if you have a contractor's quote, we also accept that. Um, or a detailed renovation summary in, in, 
in, for example, a Word document, but the more detail that you or your client is able to provide, the better. Um, and, and it helps with primarily two reasons. Number one is when we're very clear on the finishings that you're using, um, it really helps our appraisers provide a more accurate after repair value valuation. Like if you forget to mention or leave out that you're putting in high-end finishings, granite countertop, and you just say kitchen, $10,000, putting in a new uh, kitchen island, um, that that's that provides a lot of ambiguity. It, it isn't clear. Our appraisers will have to go off assumptions. So the more detail that you provide uh, helps providing with a more accurate valuation. But number two, we're actually able to provide a quicker turnaround time to have this valuation back because when there's no ambiguity and the appraiser is very clear on your renovation, then they're able to pull comps very seamlessly and do their job a lot more efficiently. So more detail you're able to provide with these renovation summaries, definitely the better uh, for you and your client. So submitting a deal, I think, I believe this is the last slide or second last slide. Um, all that we really need uh, are, uh, are typically a few documents. So application, which we have that I can send to you if you're not a mortgage broker. Credit bureau, we can pull credit uh, internally, or if you're working with a mortgage broker, typically they'll pull it. Notice of assessments. Uh, what we're looking for here is that you primarily do not owe tax. Uh, so a lot of uh, the real estate investors that borrow from us, typically their business for self, they show on paper that they make you know, uh, 30, 40 grand. Um, but as long as you have the capital, uh, as mentioned before, that's mainly what we're more focused on. So we just need to see that you have the funds from start to finish for the project versus, um, you know, serviceability from having a high income. So if you don't have a high income, but you have the capital, um, we're, we're definitely a solution. Uh, renovation plans. That was essentially the uh, Word document that I just showed you, providing us with your budget, your timelines. So we're able to get an understanding of those components. Uh, if you are borrowing in a corporation, then we just need these documents that are listed here and then proof of funds. Uh, no, I mentioned it before, but we love to pre-approve our clients before uh, you have a property available. So that's just app credit and notice of assessments. And then we only need that documentation once a year. Once we have the documentation, then it's just documents related to the deal uh, in order to provide you with a uh, quicker answer. Right. Yeah. Do you report, does Calvo report their mortgages to bureaus or no? No, we'll pull credit to see what, what credit looks like, but we do not, like, once we issue a loan, we do not appear on a credit bureau. Okay. So essentially, they can have multiple multiple mortgages under their name which they're flipping, and yes. it, would not, it would not hurt them if they were to, if they were to apply for an owner-occupied house for themselves, let's say, right? Correct. Yeah, we, we do not appear on uh, credit bureaus for our loans. Okay. Yeah. So no, we covered, we went significantly over time, covered a lot of content and, uh, and information. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any other further questions. This will be sent out with all the documentation that I referred in here. Uh, highly encourage individuals to follow us on Instagram. It's just down here off to the right-hand side. We produce a lot of educational content. It's not so much salesy. Uh, we just provide data, statistics, analytics, flip of the months in order to help uh, help the whole real estate investing community um, make better financial uh, financial decisions when it comes to real estate investing. Um, feel free to reach out to the individuals here. So uh, myself, Ryan, then we have uh, three underwriters here, Sherwin, Garrett, and Rob. Phone number for our main line, and then obviously the website as well, too. Does anyone else have any other further questions? Uh, are you taking extras with the recent fund uh, fraud cases? Are you taking extra with the uh, extra steps with the recent fraud cases? So we require uh, title insurance on, on all of our loans. Um, it's, it, that's primarily a factor. I know Rob, you have uh, was it was it you that has a story, or might be for a different time. I know we're kind of cutting into it, but uh, maybe you can touch on our, our practice for verifying clients. 
Yeah, basically we do mit we do mitigate fraud risk in our underwriting process, and then we do have insurance policies in place that will protect affected parties against fraudulent transactions. Um, I had a file where a tenant impersonated a seller, uh, and long story short, the landlord got a renovated house back for free, uh, thanks to title insurance. So it is something that we are wise to. It's something that we do uh, consider, and if um, and if a party is not identified properly uh, through another stakeholder in the uh, process, then there are policies in place to make sure that people are looked after and that uh, that nobody suffers any undue harm as a result. Ian, when are you going to hire people to work in the Ontario market? Um, great, great question. Uh, we just did a little bit of a hiring spree not too long ago, but uh, feel free to send us your, your resume. We're more than happy to keep it on file. And then whenever new opportunities do bubble up, more than happy to um, reach out and see if there's some good alignment there. Always looking for good people. 100%. Perfect. Give it a few more seconds here if no one else uh, responds in the chat or unmutes himself, then uh, we will end the call. Fantastic. Um, so you will be getting a copy of this. Um, really appreciate everyone's time and staying on for so long. Um, if anything does come out, call, text, email, feel free to reach out. More than happy to help lend our um, lend our services and just be as uh, valuable as possible if we're not able to help. Enjoy the rest of the day. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.